we're going to run through the monthly numbers today. We're going to show you what the trends are over time. Uh, Jamie, before we get started, again, just acknowledging that I look like I'm ready for a red carpet event. Big shout out to Matt Landau. We are super excited to see you next week at your premiere um, of Home Runners. So shout out to Matt. And then before we get into those September numbers, I just want to say like it's been it's been a hell of a week to be an Airbnb host. We're all over the news, man. It's like everywhere. Hashtag Airbnb bust. I love Ooh. this. I love this. So yeah. I think you I think you're a pretty avid Twitter tweeter. Tweeter? Is that a thing? Matt? No, it is now. Um but loved this from Texas runner DFW. The Airbnb bust is upon us. I was like, ah, oh, yes, we've reached the cultural zeitgeist. Uh, that was shortly followed up with a lovely BuzzFeed article that had, you know, made some made some bold claims, Jamie. And part of what our business is on this podcast is to take a look at bold claims and uncover the truth behind them, dispel some myths. So I thought it would be fun to start the podcast um, by talking a little bit about some of the statements this piece made and get your hot take on them. Maybe do a little myth busting, as they say. What do you think? Sounds great. Let's do it. Let's do it. I love it. Um, so for folks who maybe didn't read the article, there was a lot of banter around things like, is the rent too damn high? Are your rates too high? Are your fees too high? Um, shout out to Airbnb cleaning fees. Those, that was in the article, of course, as well. Uh, but it really started off with this very bold statement. It was, actually came from Insider, a uh, business insider, that is, that said bookings were down for the summer. So, Jamie Lane, we talk a lot about bookings here on this podcast and elsewhere. Are they down? Is it true? What's, what's happening with bookings? Yeah, I mean, generally bookings are not down, but if you looked at it and let's call it bookings per available listing or mm -hmm. occupancy, occupancy was down. Um, and we we're down uh, pretty strongly uh, off of the 2021 highs. We've talked about that extensively and together we and talked through it on our review and their uh, supplies up and we've got roughly 23% more listings in the US today than we had last year. Right. But, you know, actual bookings are significantly higher than last year as well. So um, in September, uh, demand was up uh, 24 percent uh, throughout the summer. It was up well north of 20 percent year over year. And we're well above 2019 levels as, high, as, as well. So are bookings down? No. Is occupancy down? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And. I think that's a key point when we look at sort of the anecdotal evidence that that um, tweet sort of pulled from, is if you go out and poll in a thousand Airbnb hosts, each one of them is going to say, and yeah, my occupancy was down, bookings were down this summer. Uh, but if you take them all in aggregate and then compare them and to the same group from or a different group or every host from last year, we're going to see there's way more hosts out there. Right. Um, but I think the the key takeaway for people is demand is not down. Uh, there's more interest than ever in staying in short term rentals today, and and we've seen no uh, pullback, uh, whether it's in historical demand, what's happened this summer, or what we're looking at out into the future. Uh, in September uh, this month, we our last month we saw nineteen percent more nights booked for future travel than we saw in September of 2021. Uh, so a lot of momentum uh, as we head into uh, the fall. Uh, and then we also, and we track Airbnb globally for um, right, that's a lot true. of our financial services clients. Yes. And, and our expectations for this quarter, Airbnb is going to report their numbers in about a week and a half. Right. Is right. that there was 104 million nights booked uh, in the third quarter, and that's up 31% year over year. So I, I do think it's going to be a blockbuster uh, reporting um, uh, quarterly earnings for, for Airbnb uh, this, this, this quarter. I Note that, that that is not financial advice, uh, and you should... <laughs> 
talk with your financial advisor before making any decisions there. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Our lawyer uh, thanks you as well. Thank Mark. <laughs> Mark, that was for you. Uh, we are not giving financial advice on this podcast. Good call. Out. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it's wonderful. I think, yeah, you know, we'll circle back in about 10 days and uh, Airbnb has an opportunity to sort of set the record straight on a lot of these things. Uh, and Jamie, I think you hinted at this a couple of different places, but a lot can impact bookings, as you just mentioned. And hey, I think, you know, the big thing to note here is, right, like we are in a seasonal business. There are highs and there are lows. Yeah. So we track, and obviously, every booking, every um, listing around the country. And, and we're tracking 1.38 million listings in the U.S. There was 150,000 of those that didn't get a booking in September. So not everyone gets a booking every month. Uh, <laughs> uh, and then also... I. To note there that that's actually a really good number comparably if we look back through history uh, and that sort of points to the sort of highs and occupancies that we're at this is yes occupancy is down but it's 11 percent higher than it was in 2019 so comparably the industry is still doing really well uh, but to your point about seasonality so in september overall demand was down 20 percent from the highs in july so if you're thinking about like I and mean, from the summer to today, like it right. looks like bookings are down, I think you've got to look at it in terms of seasonality. Uh, and and yes, that that's going to happen. We expected that to happen. Right. Um, and it's going to drop even further. Um, right. So if you're in and in looking at a lot of those comments and thinking through on some of the strategies that could maybe change those booking trends for those hosts, it's one you've got to be revenue managing. If you're keeping your rates at the high levels that you had gotten in July, um, you're not going to get any bookings. That's a clear right. way that you're going to go from 100% occupancy down to 0% really quickly. <laughs> uh, as demand adjusts, uh, guests are going to expect to pay less. Uh, and you've got to sort of meet those guest expectations there uh, and adjust your rates down. And, yeah. and <laughs> I've been an Airbnb host, and, and I know and if you adjust your rate to the right price, you're going to start getting bookings again. I love that. That's such great advice. And yeah, I think that's where it's so important to contextualize where you were a year ago, back in 2019. I think we'll talk a little bit about why you think that's a really great place to sort of index off of in terms of performance, just because of the outliers of 2020 and 21. Um, but to your point, yeah, like folks, like it's not, you can't necessarily blame macro trends all the time for slow bookings or occupancy being below your standard. You really have to run your own race here, but also be very conscious of what that might be um, and how it impacts your ADR. And then also what was great about this article, because it was it's obviously one of my favorite topics, is they brought up the cleaning fees, the service fees. There were some really great, not going to lie to you guys, there were some really great zingers out there on Twitter that I was like, ooh, good zinger. Um, <laughs> on the cleaning fees, I know you and I were both most recently, I'm just going to shout out other podcast guys. This, it's just going to happen. We were both listening to On with Kara Swisher. Uh, today, she had Brian, uh, Brian from Airbnb on the show, and he, they also talked about cleaning fees. So, Jamie, I think let's bust some myths here. Obviously, we've talked about this in previous content, um, but what sort of, yeah, what does it mean to like, all these fees? What's going on there, sir? Yeah. And one, I think it's important to break down what those fees are and, and, and one, and it, it, are you paying those fees, whether you book at a hotel or a short-term rental? Yes. So occupancy well, taxes, yeah. and that was called out a lot. Like whether you know it or not, you're paying those at a hotel, you're paying at a short-term rental. Uh, it wasn't always that short-term rentals were collecting occupancy taxes. The right. fact that, I mean, it's pretty much um, automatic now that Airbnb is going to collect it on behalf of the host and remit it to those cities is great. It sort of puts... Uh, hotels and short-term rentals on a much more fair playing field uh, and making sure everyone's sort of paying for um, paying the taxes that they should when they travel to a destination 
given all the destinations due to support travelers um, coming to their cities. Uh, the other is, is service fees. So Airbnb pays mm-hmm. play, or charges like 12, 13 uh, percent. Whether the guests paying that or the um, let's say the other OTA is or the hotel um, is and whether it's being rolled into the nightly rate or you're uh, paying it through the fees to Expedia or booking or or any of the others. And if you're booking through an OTA, uh, you're more than likely paying a 10 to 20 percent OTA service fee, whether you know it or not. Uh, and that's sort of the take that um, any uh, booking platform is going to take when you book through. Uh, now, if you want to avoid those fees, and this is what I do, sort of hot take. Hot take. Hot take. <laughs> is, for is, is, is find those listings and book them directly. So whether you do that at a hotel, find it on Expedia and book it on Hilton, uh, or you uh, find uh, a short-term rental, uh, Google their name, um, find a way, a lot of them now have ways to book direct. Uh, Shout out to the Book Direct show down in um, Miami this week. Yes. Uh, (laughs) uh, uh, And that's a way that you can avoid that Airbnb service fee or really any service fees associated with that booking. Uh, make sure that all that money is going directly uh, to the host. I love that. Yeah, that's a really good point. And Airbnb did just uh, release an update on their city portal. Um, and I think that they mentioned that they collected $1.5 billion in local tourism taxes in 2021. Um, so yeah, I think it, it's sort of that standardization of our business, um, of the industry. Those taxes do go back into governments and are super important for us. Um, to be- and and the other around cleaning fees and yes. uh, and listening to uh, uh, Brian and Kara talk on the podcast, right. it looks like there's a big update coming. I suspect it's in their 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 winter update that they they sort of do two big updates on their platform um, of um, rolling out a way for all prices to look inclusive or at least show up inclusive of cleaning fees. Uh, so that guests aren't surprised when they go to check out and see the hundred, two hundred dollar cleaning fee um, as they're checking out. So, with Airbnb doing a better job of making those fees uh, apparent up front, and when they're searching dates, when they're searching properties, they're going to see a nightly rate inclusive of all the fees. I think that's going to be a big uh, take, a huge step towards sort of changing the perception that. It may be um, I'm, um, I'm Airbnb trying to hide those fees, get right. people sort of the bait and switch of, oh, this is $150 a night property. Yep. And then yep. you go to check out and like, how am I paying $300 a night? Uh-huh. Which I think leads to a lot of, <laughs> a lot of the sort of negative reaction that we see uh, out there in the press and in the media. I love it. I love it. Yeah. Well, and I think there is an element of the people have spoken, right? So yes, there are the fees, I think, you know, let's talk about in a minute, just sort of dispel that myth that, you know, hotels may or may not be cheaper than short term rentals, because I think you have some good data there. Um, but one of the things that just strikes me, right, is that like, you know, it is important as hosts, I'm going to use my line, Jamie, I know it's cheesy, but you got to keep the hospitable and hospitality folks, right? So like, at the end of the BuzzFeed article, one woman said, you know what, I don't charge cleaning fees, right? It's not worth it to me. It is a major differentiator for me. It gets me more bookings. It's part of her revenue management strategy not to do it. Um, and so there is, I think, an element of just like, if if people are complaining about this, let's address it, right? As hosts. Um, yeah, and that's, that's actually an option that I, many are taking up now. Um, and I think Airbnb is actually... Uh, using, if people are doing this, sort of moving them up higher in the search. So there's the option. Mm. You can include your cleaning fee in your rate. Yeah. Uh, and But also include service fees in your rate. So when the guest goes to check out, there may still be that occupancy tax at the end. Right. But they're essentially paying I'm, the rate that they saw. Um, and it's essentially including all the fees in that rate. So right now it's an option. Um, and I think they're just going to make it much um, uh, clear and a lot. Of, I've seen a lot of on talking to hosts uh, that they're making that change and they're seeing a significant uptick uh, in bookings after they make that change. Love it, yeah. Because you may just not be able to avoid now that it's in the cultural zeitgeist. 
it's on BuzzFeed people. It's officially um, jumped the shark, I guess, is the word that I'll use, the phrase that I'll use. Uh, Abby's going to have so much work with these show notes, Jamie. She's going to have to define everything for people. Um, all right. So hotel costs versus short-term rental costs. Um, oh, yeah. So so that one. What's happening there? Um, so we just did a big study with... Um, STR, uh, Smith Travel Research. Confusingly, yeah. I'm, we're the STR Data Lab. Uh, they are STR, the company. Uh, uh, they track uh, hotel performance. Uh, but one thing we did in, in this study was looking at like-for-like -like pricing for hotels and short-term rentals. Uh, and we've uh, looked at a bunch of different consumer surveys. And time after time on... Um, when pe people are asked why they choose short-term rentals uh, compared to hotels, yep. the top two reasons are location and price. So location, obviously, I and mean, if you're going to maybe the beach or the mountains and there's just not hotel options, you sort of move towards the short-term rental option. Uh, that's in a lot of different places. That's your only option to, to stay. Uh, and then on price, uh, and objectively, short-term rentals are still cheaper than hotels. Uh, and how we sort of looked at that is looked at um, comparable cities uh, and then um, comparable properties. So gotcha. um, uh, so for short-term rentals, just looking at one bedroom studios uh, and then comparing that to the average hotel room. Uh, and in urban areas today, uh, the average short-term rental is still 20% cheaper than the average hotel. Uh, and that really holds across all location types, most cities. There are some sort of destinations. You get to some remote mountain areas where um, and getting a one-bedroom home right. um, is, I think, for I'm justifiably going to cost more than a one-bedroom hotel room, yeah. uh, given all the additional things you're going to get with that home, uh, kitchen, living room, additional space. Uh, things like that. So I think on average, we can dispel it as a myth busted. Uh, but and there are going to be sort of certain caveats out there where, yeah, the hotel option might be cheaper, but I mean, comparably, you're still getting more from that short-term rental listing. Love it. All right, guys. Well, you heard it here. Some myths busted. Um, Always, it's always nice to kind of take some of the craziness in the media and bring us back down to earth. Thank you, Jamie. Um, I'm full of mom jokes. I'm just going to keep going with them. Uh, speaking of some buzz getting created, you yourself, again, <laughs> avid tweeter that you are, uh, posted a tweet earlier this week as well. It was about listing growth. Uh, really love this. I think the feedback was uh, tremendous. I think it was great to see people. Uh, you know, and just a good reminder for all of us, right? Like a good visual, a good graph can make a big difference for people in terms of under, their understanding of a problem. Um, so it's great to get some some air DNA love there, but also sparked a lot of healthy conversation, right? So yeah, Jamie, talk to me about like what was what was your biggest surprise in the comments? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, there was there was lots of comment comments. Uh, uh, admittedly, my first uh, uh, semi-viral tweet. Yes. Uh, so that was uh, interesting to see sort of the fallout from that. A lot of media attention, <laughs> uh, a lot of media interest to sort of dive into what's happening there. Uh, but I think there's I mean, a few things to call out. I and mean, one is I mean, churn. Um, and yeah. sort of what that chart calls out is I and mean, there is significant churn in the uh, short-term rental industry of yeah. people that bring listings on, uh, pull them out for various reasons. Uh, uh, headline there was, I think it was like 54% of listings on Airbnb today had been added since 2020. Yep. Uh, so added over the past two and a half years. Um, and maybe too long to sort of draw out into that tweet. But if you go back and look through like prior years, like, is that abnormal? Right. And it's actually some of the lowest levels it's ever been. Um, and that's a combination of growth. So in 2012 to let's say 2018, 2019, and Airbnb was growing massively. 
Uh, and from 2012 to 2016, they were essentially doubling their listings every year. Um, so obviously, a huge percent of their listings are going to be added in the past two and a half years. Yeah, um, yep. Good point. And churn today is not anywhere near um, or any we're near what it's been in the past. We don't see significantly higher churn in the U.S. Uh, you do see it a bit globally, but that's all because of Airbnb pulling out of China um, right, right. And, the, and the impact there. Uh, roughly 500,000 listings removed when they, when they pulled out of that market. Uh, so uh, the other sort of point there, and I think a lot of people pulled out, and it was interesting on this point, yeah. People called it out as a good thing and a bad thing, even <laughs> though it's the sort of same number as sort of each person's individual take on on yeah. the uh, on the same trend. Um, is just how much listings have grown over the past few years. Yep. Um, and and if you go from today, maybe back to 2019, uh, pre-pandemic, uh, supply has only grown about 20 percent. Um, if you and <laughs> Put that as a headline, it can maybe sound alarming right. uh, that Airbnb <laughs> supply has grown 20%, or maybe put it in context of that it was growing I mean, 30, 40, 100% in prior years. It's like, oh, I mean, three year period and they've only grown 20%. That's, that's, that's not very scary. And um, a key point there is I think that, and we are as an industry undersupplied right now, I'm only adding 20% of listings given how much yeah. uh, the industry has really grown uh, and we've sort of grown in the eyes of the consumer um, and, and sort of points to a clear under supply, especially in most popular destinations um, and being able to accommodate people when they want to come. Um, and, and, and you can point to our still almost record high occupancy levels. Yeah. And we were, uh, only down 1.2 percent off of our Amazing. 2021 high uh, in the U.S. So, and overall, like hosts are are doing pretty well when you sort of compare us to past years. As I said, up 11 percent versus 2019. It's just it's like it's. I know I say it way too often, but you really just have to have context to these numbers in order to make sense of them. So that was incredibly helpful, and and also. Maybe facts before feelings, right? It feels like things are up, but fact, facts before feelings. Um, your t-shirts are in the mail, everybody. Your t-shirts are in the mail. <laughs> well, I thought I thought this was one, this tweet was very interesting and something that we could definitely, I know you addressed a lot of people's comments um, in the in that Twitter feed, uh, but but some individual said, one individual said, Half of the listings are always new within the last two years. Volume is up, but the pattern is the same. It is meaningless without relationship to demand. So Jamie, you just kind of, you talked a little bit about um, this in context to supply and occupancy, but just where are we at from your perspective, having just wrapped the numbers for September uh, on travel demand? How's travel demand yeah. these days? I am and overall travel demand is great. Uh, so I mentioned an earlier Airbnb reporting or will probably report around 1.4 million uh, nights booked in the quarter. Yep. Uh, that's up over 30% year over year and up um, 22% uh, compared to 2019. So listings are up 20%, demand's up over 20%, we're seeing more bookings per listing uh, than we'd seen um, in prior years. So, and overall that points to the higher occupancies that we're seeing globally. Uh, so uh, sort of great, I think, and yes, his point is valid. Uh, <laughs> and I think um, I'm not saying that it's not, it's in a clear reading of what that chart says. And I think what we talked about that, yes, there's a lot of churn. There's always a lot of churn. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, uh, definitely a valid point there. I love it. Yeah. Well, and it's, I think it's just great to sort of, because I know we talk a lot about travel demand being up. So just to contextualize that with a few numbers. Yeah. And, and, and we just yeah. saw from STR today, uh, yes. <laughs> the yes. hotel company, not the, uh, uh, um, <laughs> uh, the industry, um, that uh, hotel demand exceeded 
2019 levels for the first month uh, ever uh, wow. here in the U.S. So up uh, a percent and a half over 2019 levels. I, I think that sort of in combination with our data and sort of points to real strength of uh, still the, uh, the traveler uh, out there. Uh, TSA checkpoints. Um, yes. So the TSA throughput uh, reached a new uh, uh, post-pandemic high or post mm. Uh, start of pandemic high, uh, <laughs> highest level since February 2020. Uh, <laughs> uh, so more people getting on airplanes, even more people this fall than getting on the plane during the summer. Uh, so great to see uh, so many people now getting back to travel. Yeah. Uh, and then on the economic side, like still no slowdown in job growth or no significant sort of pullback in job growth. Two hundred sixty-three thousand. Yeah. New jobs added. Um, yes, that's down from prior months, right. but it's still maybe a, a bit too high for uh, <laughs> for the Fed. Uh, yeah. And I think we've talked about this in the past, but it's like a we're in this moment where we kind of want bad news, and right. good news yeah. is actually bad news, and bad news is good news. So if if we would have only gotten a hundred thousand jobs or fifty thousand jobs or flat jobs, everybody like, yeah, the stock market would have gone up. Like jobs growth is going down. Like we're slowing the economony, uh, with which which is what the uh, Fed's trying to do. Right, um, right. And we we got an absolutely horrible um, uh, inflation report. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that came out last week. Yeah. Uh, so. Um, uh, headline inflation up 8.2%, core inflation up 6.6%, actually um, number ticking up uh, from prior months. Mm-hmm. So I think it was like three or four months ago, it was like, pay attention to this number. Yep. If yep. we start to see it come down, that's our sort of indication that we might be able to avoid a recession. If it keeps ticking up, that means the Fed's going to keep pressing on the gas and raising interest rates and and creating further destruction uh, in the economy. So I mean, all things right now are pointing to the Fed continuing to raise interest rates and, and the chance of recession uh, keeps getting higher and higher. You know, we might have to start doing like a barometer read for people. <laughs> um, but yeah, we, we don't want to depress anyone uh, too much. Although, you know, I think it's just, it's helpful to be prepared and we said, try to find sort of the way the way through it. And we've talked a lot in our first podcast about sort of understanding what type of recession uh, we might might be encountering in the future and how that may be quite different from recessions we've had in the past. I think a lot of us have um, sort of the 08 one in our heads and, and that one may look very differently than um, future ones, potentially, potentially. Um, well, Jamie, I want to like just really quick and then we can absolutely wrap up, um, unpack. So you said acu- actually occupancy um, was only 1.2%, I think, lower year over year for September. Is that true? And that was crazy because like August had a completely different show, story, right? I think it was 4.4% lower occupancy. Yeah, no, that that is true. And it's... I'm- um, and still down, obviously, but yeah. not nearly as down as much as we'd seen uh, during the summer. Uh, I think uh, something that a trend that we called out last year that's still playing out today uh, is the extended seasonality that yeah. a lot of uh, the destinations are are seeing. They're not seeing maybe the highs of July and, and August, but it's definitely extending out uh, demands extending out in a lot of these destinations uh, much further out than um, in previous years, uh, and I, I think it's it's being driven by I mean, two things. Uh, the mov- most obvious one is the increased flexibility we still all have, I and mean, both of us are working from home right now, uh, still trying to get in the office uh, <laughs> occasionally, uh, but with the flexibility, um, it, we're not sort of um, and uh, sort of restricted to the times when uh, just the summer to get out and vacation. Uh, so we're still seeing the benefit of that. And I suspect uh, that probably is going to be a more permanent shift uh, in Got seasonality. Um, and given uh, that work from home uh, yeah. isn't going away. Uh, 
And then uh, the other is just how high occupancy continues to be during the summer right. and people having to push out their vacations uh, to the shoulder season because they can't get get to the destinations they want to travel to right. uh, in the month right. they want to because they're entirely sold out. So, yeah. I mean, it's sort of a, a function of how strong these markets are uh, right. and how far in advance uh, they're getting booked up, uh, which... Yeah. That may be a great reminder. Um, I'm not sure if we have a lot of guests listening or, or it's just hosts, but yeah. if you haven't started to plan your fall, your Thanksgiving uh, and winter trips, uh, things are booking up uh, quickly and we're, we're seeing really strong demand as we look out into uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas um, uh, uh, travel. Thank you for calling this out because, you know, I did this all wrong. I was thinking about spring break before our ski trips. Okay. All right. All right, guys. Homework for me. Um, I wanted to end on one other really bright spot that I loved in the September review. Um, so you actually called out that September marked the first month since April where ADR, average daily rate, um, growth exceeded the rate of the consumer price index, otherwise known as the CPI. Mm -hmm. Um, so and anything to unpack there? I just thought that was kind of a lovely note. It sounds like that may be getting harder for us, right? Like short term, looking pretty good for us. Long term, maybe a slightly different story. Yeah, and, and we had seen rate growth get pretty weak um, this summer. Yeah. Um, and I think that was and in part, and <laughs> you're going to uh, see the economist come out with me, come out, <laughs> come out uh, of here. like the... <laughs> The relationship between occupancy declines and sort of and pulling back on rates. If and and as a host, if you're not getting the occupancy that you expect or you've seen in prior years, uh, you're going to pull back on rate, or you should be pulling back on rate to sort of drive occupancy uh, to your property. Um, so during the summer, when occupancy was dropping a bit more, uh, rate growth was much weaker. Um, with sort of I'm not as uh, big of declines in occupancy as we add into uh, fall. Uh, we're now seeing occupancy growth um, a bit stronger than we'd seen during the summer, gotcha. um, helping offset maybe some of those increased expenses uh, given the inflationary environment that we're in. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'd love to see uh, ADRs sort of stay above that 5%, right. uh, sort of uh, helping hosts sort of cover all the additional costs that go along with um, with hosting, uh, with the labor associated with it. Uh, we are seeing an uptick a bit more than ADRs on cleaning fees. So cleaning fee increases um, running eight, nine percent. So um, a bit higher than ADR growth, but that's, and as we've talked about in the, in the past, a, a whole lot more associated with the labor, right, um, the cost and, of labor. and really the lack of available labor uh, for, for cleaning properties. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Jamie. I have, uh, as always enjoyed talking, uh, to you. I've also really enjoyed seeing Airbnb get in the news a little bit more. Um, obviously what's at the forefront of both of our minds is, uh, Verma VRMA. We're super stoked to get down there and talk to people. Um, since we're in the, we're doing a love fest for other podcasts, I think today, uh, just shout out to Sarah and T they did a really great podcast on sessions that they thought were the best to catch. So for anyone that is going down there or just wants to know what's going on, highly recommend it. Um, but otherwise, I got to I gotta go book some winter travel, Jamie. I don't know about you, but <laughs> I got to get busy over yeah. here. I actually just booked my trip out to Focusrite in Phoenix. Looking forward to that <laughs> one uh, in uh, November. So that should be a good one. Yeah, that'll be like coming from Denver, which you aren't. But um, if you were, you'd be like, oh, Phoenix in November. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I only say that to to brag a bit that I booked yeah. all my Christmas and Thanksgiving mm -hmm. travel about two months ago. Yeah, yeah. That's, well, that's because you, you're smarter than me, generally speaking. But yeah, this is, again, just <laughs> next time, let me know. Be like, Mariah, <laughs> you're looking too far into the future. Yeah. <laughs> Alrighty, sir. Let's call right. that a wrap. What do you think? Yeah. Great podcast. Love it.